Welcome to St. Andrews this morning on this uh, bright and beautiful day. Let's open in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the summer, the summer heat. And uh, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to come here into your house and to worship you this morning, Lord. So we just ask that you open up our hearts and our minds to what is uh, spoken and heard here this morning. And may we invite you in. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand, if you're able, and worship with us this morning. is 
Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you that we live our lives in your hands, that you know the beginning from the end, that all we are comes from you. We say thank you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I have a question for you. We have five senses. Can you name what the five senses are? So, how, how, so, so we have five senses, right? Do you know what the senses are? Yeah. yeah. So can you name one of them? Touch. Touch. Another one? Taste. taste. Touch, taste, yep. Sight. Sight. Smell. Smell. We're missing one. Hearing. Hearing, you're right. So can you tell me something that smells really good? Something that when you smell it, you say, that's a really good smell. Yep. Barbecue. Barbecue? Yep. Fire? Fire? Pizza? Pizza? Baked cookies? Baked cookies? Can you tell me something that tastes really good? Ice cream. Ice cream. Burgers? Burgers? Popcorn? Okay. Something that sounds really good. Music? They've done a poll, <clears throat> a survey, and they've asked people the three things they most want to hear, the three th sentences they would most like to hear. And the first one is no surprise, I love you. The second one is, I forgive you. And the third is, dinner's ready. <laughs> right? Those are all good things to hear, right? So, touch. When you're sad, is a hug a nice thing to have? When you've done really well, when someone gives you a high five, does that feel good? Yeah. And there are lots of things in the world to see, aren't there, that are beautiful. God's given us these five sense, senses, taste, touch, hearing, seeing, t um, smell, so that we can enjoy the world that God has made. God's made us human beings, physical beings, with the ability to enjoy the world that God has made. So let's thank God for all these beautiful things that he's given to us. Lord God, we thank you for the five senses and for the ability we have to rejoice, to celebrate your world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Head your glasses. First, let us come to the Lord with a, our prayer of illumination. Let us pray. God, our Father, as we read your holy word, the Bible, open our hearts, clear our minds, Open our ears to listen to your voice and give us the courage to accept your call. May your Holy Spirit inspire us and encourage us to proclaim the gospel. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, amen. Starting with a very familiar passage from Ecclesiastes. I Every time I read this passage, which is about once a year, I always feel I should have somebody up playing, yes. The bird song that goes to the background of this, all right. Don't worry, I won't sing it. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love 
and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. And turning to the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 1. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. We continue in our series about what are human beings. Last week, we talked about the fact that human beings, we, human persons, are made in the image of God. <clears throat> we thought a lot about what it meant to say in the image of God. We actually spent very little time thinking about made, that we are created, that we are not the creator, we are the creature. We have been made by God. There is one who is greater than us, the creator who has made us, shaped us, formed us. And so this morning, we're going to think about what it means to be human-sized, to be creatures, not creator, to be the ones who have been made. And what does that say to us? But a brief tangent for a moment. In this entire series, we remind ourselves that we are a Christian church, and therefore, what we say about who we are as individuals, what we say about anything, in fact, as a Christian church, is not driven by what the culture says, by what even people out there might say, but we are driven by two realities, two foundational realities. The Bible, which is the Word of God, the written Word of God for us, and Jesus, who is the lived Word, the incarnate Word of God in our presence. And 
foundational to anything we say and think about who we are, our calling, what it is that we are as human beings are rooted in those two foundational pieces. We are human-sized. The passage from Ecclesiastes makes that very clear. There is a rhythm to life. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to mourn and a time to dance. As we are the start of harvest season, we remind ourselves that there was a time to plant, and now there's a time to harvest, and then there will be a new time to plant, and a new time to harvest, and a new time to plant, a new time to harvest, you get the idea. A flow, a rhythm, a pattern. And human beings through time have tried to change those patterns. I'll give you one small example. Napoleon thought that a 10-day working week would be much better than seven-day. And so he imposed one. 12 months of 30 days exactly, three weeks each, with five days at the end of the year to party. His new calendar worked for two years. Because there is about something about one in seven that is a rhythm built into our lives. A rhythm, a pattern, you get the point. Unchangeable, built into us, this rhythm, this pattern, this being human. And there is a sense when you read Ecclesiastes 3, the first eight verses, that this rhythm is a cycle, a circle. It keeps on going round and round and round. As the writer himself says to us, God has put into our imagining, our knowing, that there is a past, that there is a future, but because we are human-sized, both the past and the future are unknown to us. And so we live this human-sized life in this moment, in this time. A quick comment on not knowing the past. We think we know the past. But as someone who's trained as a historian, I can tell you, we don't. What we think the past is, is our perception of it. The past is far more complicated than we could ever imagine. And anyone who's lived through COVID knows that the future is completely unpredictable. We have this moment. We are human-sized. When Jesus was raised to life again, he met with his disciples, and the disciples said, wow, you've defeated death, so the kingdom's coming, the reign of God is at hand. When's it going to arrive? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the dates or times that the Father has set by his own authority. And in another place, Jesus says that he himself, while he lived among us as a human being, did not know the time when the end would come. There is a reality that we are human-sized in our knowledge. Our son, Nathan, likes to say the line that when a scientist says on the radio that they're not sure, what they really mean is we haven't the foggiest clue. Even science Even science doesn't know everything. We are human-sized. This past week, we have had two dramatic examples of the challenge that lies before us as human beings. We are deep into the Olympics. And yes, I want the men's Canadian men's basketball team to do really well. They just pulled it out last, last, yes, last night. I was very thrilled. Anyways, 
the motto of the Olympics is higher, faster, stronger. And in the next two weeks, we will witness enormous efforts, incredible action as individuals break records, go where no human being has gone before, done what no human being has done before. And yes, it feels like maybe we are bigger than human-sized, or at least some of us are. But the week started with a profound moment in which President Biden said he would not run again. And if you want to tear away all the words that were spoken, at core, he really said, at 81, I'm too old to do this. That's really what he meant. He acknowledged publicly, and I give him full credit for this, that he is human-sized. The President of the United States is human-sized. Now, at this point, you can feel very depressed. This feels like a limitation, a narrowing, a controlling. I don't think so. I have a colleague who is a specialist in helping congregations do turnaround. Congregations that have been in trouble to find thriving life. And she visited a congregation that had done that. She had not been involved in the process, but she was trying to learn what they did and how it worked. And a key lay leader was showing her around the building and telling the story of what had happened. And partway through that conversation, the key lay leader said to my friend, our minister can put the entire Bible into seven words. Well, that's pretty impressive, right? Downright impressive. So my friend asked, so what are the seven words? And this is what she was told. God is God and we are not. The third song we sang this morning said the same thing, did it not? God holds us. God walks with us. God is beside us, cares for us profoundly. But we're not God. And to be perfectly honest, I'm happy about that. Because if I was God-sized, I would have all the problems and headaches that God has to deal with. And I can tell you, I don't want that job. If we go back to Biden and Obama, isn't it remarkable how much they aged during their presidency? There may be things that maybe as human beings we shouldn't do to rejoice in who we are and the size that we are. And the second part of the passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that we read goes exactly there. Five times in the book. Let me back up and give you some of the plot line to Ecclesiastes. The author starts by saying, I'm going to find happiness in the world. I'm going to find what makes us truly, truly happy. And so he tries, and he is, incredibly wealthy and makes an enormous amount of wealth. But he says, there's a problem with wealth. Because you're going to leave it behind when you die, and someone's going to waste it. So the acquisition of money is a chasing after the wind. 
So he tried pleasure, the finer things in life, chased all of those things. But as they discovered, the author discovered, there's never an end to new experiences. And with each new experience, the bang is smaller. And quite quickly, we become jaded. So the pursuit of pleasure, in the author's words, is yet more chasing after the wind. So then they pursued knowledge to be the most intelligent person in the world. But as the author realized there is no end to that pursuit, that every question one answers opens more questions than you began with, And even the radical pursuit of knowledge becomes, in the end, a chasing after the wind. Which, if you just wondered, no one's ever caught the wind, right? So at the end of chapter 2 in Ecclesiastes, and four more times in the book, including one of the passages that we read, the author says, There is nothing better in life for human beings than to eat and to drink and to take pleasure in their toil, to live a human-sized life. Isn't it interesting that how many of the examples of senses, experiencing some senses that brought joy to the kids related to food, right? Eating is a pretty basic human-sized activity. We should hear in the word taking pleasure in our toil, not necessarily work for pay, but calling work, purpose, activity to do. And I've been thinking about this, and I'll come back to this later in the series. So I'm going to go off on a tangent here that you can chew on for a couple of weeks. So what do you do when you retire? What do you do when you turn 80, 85? What work do you have? And it strikes me that one of the things that is part of that is to say to those younger, to live for those younger, you can be human. You can rejoice in life, even at 85 and 90 and 96. There is joy in that life. Purpose, presence. Now, being human-sized, I think, is a good thing. a joyful thing. Because it allows us to not be God, to let God be God and let us let go. To not have to chase after the Joneses. To not have to be greater than I am. Kate Bowler in this book entitled, No Cure for Being Human, which sort of gives away the whole premise of the book, right? No Cure for Being Human, tells a story of her battle with cancer. Two things I need to give you, tell you about Bowler first. Bowler grew up in Winnipeg, and she has a PhD in history, which makes her someone I'm a fan of. At 35, she was diagnosed with cancer. Shortly after she had cancer surgery, pushing herself to get better so she could go home, she went down to the gift shop, which was the same floor where the Starbucks was, 
and found herself in the gift shop of the hospital in front of the books. Now, as I said, the Boulder is a church historian with a PhD. Her specialty is examining the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel churches. So as she describes herself, just out of a hospital bed, her hair a mess, acting with a little crazed attitude, she's standing in front of the books. The cashier, who's a teenager, is trying scarily afraid to stare around what she's doing as she sits and stands there in a hospital gown. As she pulls off of the shelf all the books that say, just think bigger, be positive. You can cure yourself by thinking well of yourself. She's pulling them off the shelf and throwing them on the floor. Finally, the manager comes and asks what's going on. And Boulder said, these books do not belong in a hospital because they say that patients can make themselves better simply by thinking about it. And this place doesn't believe that. It's a hospital. And it's a lie. It's a lie. Boulder had stage four liver cancer. The survival rate with stage four liver cancer is 14%. As she says very clearly in her book, she doesn't know why she survived, and 86% don't. But she was very clear it's not because she was more positive, not because she was better somehow, because, as she says, there is no cure for being human. There is a joy. There is a joy and a contentment that can come with being human. To rejoicing that God has made us human-sized. To celebrate that profound truth. So does that then mean that we shouldn't strive, we shouldn't work at it, we shouldn't try to get better? No, I think all of those things we should do. But we need to understand the balance. A balance embedded in what's called a serenity prayer. Some of you will know it. It's by Reinhold Niebuhr. Grant me the strength to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. There are things we cannot change. And our lives will be better if we simply say, that's okay. There are things we can change. And we are called to do what we can to make that happen. But the kicker is this. How do we know which is which? And only by the Holy Spirit's help will we have the wisdom to know what is our responsibility and what is not. And to be content in that. To, as the author of Ecclesiastes would invite us, to eat and drink and take pleasure in all of our toil, our work. Thanks be to God that we are made human-sized. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, we rejoice that you have made us human beings, human-sized. We rejoice that you are greater than us, we are not God. Teach us the 
contentment of being human-sized and to rejoice in living human-sized lives. And we echo the prayer that you would grant us the strength to accept the things we cannot change, the, tr- the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We do come praying for our world. Our hearts break over what has happened in Jasper. We pray for those who have been displaced, for those who face the daunting task of rebuilding. We pray for firefighters across Western Canada as they face enormous difficulty and challenge and grow increasingly tired. Remember places of war in our world, Sudan, Ukraine, Gaza, and ask that you bring peace. We remember those who are sick. We pray for those who grieve. Remember those who are anxious. And we come saying thank you for the blessings you pour into our lives the good that comes to us because of your love and grace holding on to us. We rejoice. In this silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. Pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray for the offering. God of grace, we thank you for the gifts that you give to us. We return some of them to you that you might proclaim your good news throughout all the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. introduce a new song this morning. It's our last song. And I was thinking, as uh, Peter was mentioning this morning, having joy in uh, being human-sized and being human beings. And uh, so this song kind of actually made me think uh, of that as well, that uh, we go through different times. And uh, having joy is giving praise. So praising when times are good and when times are bad. And this song is simply called Praise. We might require your help in clapping. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, is now and forevermore. Amen.